Hi, uh, my name is Mike Schoen. Uh, I wrote the book, this book, The Cobra Ferrari Wars, uh, published first in 1990, republished in 2005, and today we're going to talk about the 427 Cobra. If you trace back what happened with the 427 Cobra, it really tells what happened in Shelby America and tells the story of a lot of the people. Of course, the Cobra first raced uh, the 289 at the very end of 1962. And by uh, the end of 1963, the Cobra, the 289 Cobra, was totally destroying the brand new Corvette. I mean, the Corvette could not win. So General Motors was upset. Now, a guy who was uh, working for Ford in Detroit and was a liaison with Shelby American, that was, his name was Ray Geddes. So Ray Geddes had his ear to the ground and he heard that General Motors was going to introduce a big block Corvette. So he started uh, telling Shelby, look, uh, uh, General Motors is going to produce a 427 Corvette. And so we've got to do something to deal with that. That impetus was the, the birth of the 427 Cobra. So Shelby, during um, uh, 1963, at the end, he tells Ken Miles, the end of the season, take a regular street for a 289 Leaf Spring Cobra, pull a motor out and put in uh, the available motor that we have, uh, the big block Ford motor, which is the 427. So Miles did that. And uh, the car that came out of that was uh, serial number CSX2196. And that became the test bed for the, the hope for uh, 427 Cobra. That's a car they ran at Sebring and Miles Kreischer car at Sebring, but it performed pretty well. So Ken Miles was sort of the, the lone ranger there. He was the, the fabricator, sort of the, the uh, shade tree engineer, figured out how to make that car work. Then Ford said, okay, we're going to commit to a new Cobra. It's gonna be the, uh, a big block Cobra, an all new Cobra. And they gave that job to a Ford engineer. His name was Bob Nagstead. And that story is also uh, in the book. So Nagstead, he goes over during the 1964 racing season, he goes over to uh, England and he talks to AC Cars. And Nagstead, he, he has a design uh, with a new tubular chassis with uh, uh, steel panels that, that stiffen up the, his design of this new tube chassis. And he gets over to England and uh, AC Cars, which is supposedly going to produce this new Cobra, they say we're not going to use that design because it's, it's using a different uh, uh, a steering gear, it's using uh, different, uh, it'll use different hubs, and we want to use all the parts we have. We have a lot of body parts too. So you're going to take what we have and modify your design so that we can use it. Well, with the, with the parts we've got. Well, Nagstead, this is uh, during the summer of 1964, so Nagstead still doesn't know uh, what motor he's going to use, if it's going to be a 427 or not. Now, by this time, it's clear that uh, Chevrolet is going to introduce the next year, 1965, the 396 Corvette. So Shelby American and Ford are trying to figure out what motor they're going to use. And so Ken Miles takes this car that he ran at Sebring, 2196, and he tears it all apart again. And he makes a tilt nose, a tilt tail, stiffens the chassis even more. And he starts running a formal test program with uh, the 427 cast iron motor with a 390 aluminum motor and with a stroked small block motor. So Nagstead's over in England, and Nagstead, of course, he wants to use the 390 aluminum motor because it's going to be lighter and it's going to work better. But th that motor keeps blowing up on the dyno, so they can't make that motor work. So he gets a uh, telegram from Ray Geddes uh, saying, uh, you're going to use a 427 motor, uh, go down to the airport, there's two motors there in London on pallets for you. So Nagstead's very upset because he's designed this 427 car already around uh, the 390 aluminum block engine. So, and of course guys like Pete Brock and Dan Gurney are, are saying, don't use a heavy 427 motor, use a stroke small block. So anyway, 
So Nate's dead now, he's upset because he's got fellow uh, guy, fellow engineers from Ford of uh, Detroit who had been in England working on the GT40, but he had to work on this lousy Cobra, and now it's going to be changed, it's not going to work well. So he makes some changes to fit the, uh, the 427 motor in, and <clears throat> changes to the front suspension, that's in the book, and, and, uh, and right then at that time, uh, early September, the racing season is also over uh, for the 289 Cobras that have been running in Europe. So the crew that had been working on that, including Phil Remington, they come over to AC Cars before they come back to the United States and they start working with Bob Nakestead and with AC Cars to put together this new 427 Cobra. Now, the reason I'm sitting in front of this car is that this car is an exact replica of that very first 427 Cobra, uh, CSX3002. And 24 years ago, I actually owned the original uh, Shelby American uh, CSX3002. And at that time, a fellow I knew who was starting to produce what we would call a reproduction Cobras, he did borrow my original car and he copied it and built this car. So if you look at this car, it's got a lot of odd things on it that the production 427 race cars did not have because it was the first car. When they built the original of this car at AC Cars in England, they took a 289 nose, it's got the flat bottom, and, and they put an oil cooler on, but the oil cooler they had was from a helicopter, so it was square, so they made a little square box for it. They figured, well, we're going to use the 289 roll bar, which is the forward uh, brace roll bar, and that's what they've got in here. These rear fenders were actually uh, fenders that they already had in stock from the FIA 289 competition cover. So they put these fenders here and then put a little inch and a half or two inch strip right down the center to make them even wider. And if you look on the original 3002, you'll see that uh, under the fenders, you'll see that's where they built the fenders. They didn't have there, they had uh, 289 race wheels too. They didn't have the, the wider 427 wheels built yet. They also built their own uh, custom scoop that was never replicated for the engine. There's a lot of the, 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 the things that were retained on the production 427 race cars are on this car. For example, the battery that sits here in back of the passenger seat. The, the dry sump was added by Ken Miles once they, he started driving because he was having problems with the uh, scavenging the oil, but after a while they solved that just through an oil pan and, and they discontinued, uh, they only built a few race cars with the dry sump. They could make a regular wet sump work. The reason that the 427 Competition Cobra has the big side pipes out on the side, on the exterior of the car, is that uh, they had originally planned to have the car wider and have enough room in the engine compartment to uh, run the exhaust pipes under the uh, foot boxes and then under the car exiting out in front of the rear fenders just like the 289 did. But because the 427 motor is bigger than the 289, they didn't have enough room. So their quick and dirty last minute solution was to run the side pipes out. And of course that's one of the big signature things that people like about the 427 competition holders is the pipes came out from the outside. And that was not really intended that way. But so that's Bob Nagston. He's got this car done and now it's done. So now they they uh, ship it over really quick to uh, Riverside or to uh, Shelby's operation in California and Ken Miles starts to develop and test it because that's what Ken Miles enjoyed doing and to optimize it and uh, make it better and of course they, they added things like lighter uh, castings up front to because we had a lot more weight this thing probably I'm guessing uh, weighs maybe 250 more pounds when you count the engine and transmission uh, than a comparable 289 race car and it's it's all up front so they had a little more uh, understeer and they had the same brakes the same racing brakes as the 289 race car which were uh, girling what they call the CR brakes but but you, we, we now had 250 more pounds so when the Cobra crew is there at AC Cars in September finishing uh, 
the original of this car, uh, the guy who's really running the show is Phil Remington, the, the master fabricator and sort of genius that made uh, Shelby American vehicles work. So then the car goes back to Shelby American and Ken Miles starts driving it right away. So he's driving it in October of 1964 in California testing. And so Shelby, having just lost uh, the uh, FIA season with the 289 Cobra to Ferrari, he tells Pete Brock, who had designed the uh, 289 Cobra Daytona Cobra, he says, Pete, uh, we've got an all-new chassis here with a way more powerful motor that's going to go faster at Le Mans and big tracks in Europe. So you design another coupe, a, a new coupe that'll be the 427 Super Coupe. So Pete starts working on it, and uh, believe it or not, uh, by uh, Christmas of 1964, Pete Brock has a quarter scale model, and he also has uh, drawings that will allow a competent fabricator to build the car, and he's ready to ship them to the same people in Modena, Italy that built the uh, 289 Daytona Coupes, the five ones they built there. So he gets ready to do that, but there is an, an accountant uh, whose name is Peyton Kramer, who's involved with Shelby American. He works for Ford. So he comes to Pete and says, oh no, he says, uh, we don't need to have those Italians in Italy build this super coupe. I can get a bill for a lot less money uh, in uh, London by a subcontractor that's involved with the GT40. And so Pete says, well, you know, I'd rather not, but you're the guy that's got the money. And, you know, we work with the, the, the guys with the 289 uh, Daytona Coupe. They did a great job in Modena. And Pete had been in Modena at the end of 64 working on those cars, so he knew. But no, Peyton Kramer says, we're going to go and have the subcontractor in uh, London do it. So at the very same time that all this is happening, there's big changes in Ford, and this uh, is what really ultimately affects uh, Shelby American. Ford is impatient, and John Wire with the 29 GT40 hasn't done, had the kind of success during the 1964 season that Ford wants. So Ford says, dude, in December of 1964 said, uh, John Wire, you can still build the production cars, but the racing is going to Shelby American. So they shipped over the John Wire's racing cars to Shelby American, and uh, Shelby starts working on it. Well, at the same time, in uh, December of 64 and January of 65, Ford is also saying, uh, you know, we've got a really good motor, and it's a 427 uh, cast iron motor that's used in NASCAR, and let's put it into a GT40. So they have a subcontractor in the Detroit area called Carcraft, K-A-R, Craft. And uh, let's, let's get those guys, put that motor into the uh, 427 Cobra and get a transmission that can handle that. So Carcraft starts working on their 427 motor. All the while, for, Shelby knows this and John Wire knows it. So the guy, various guys at Shelby and guys at John Wire are, are telling Ford, uh, you don't need that big motor. You could use a stroked uh, a 289, even a regular 289 will work. But Ford's a little bit impatient. Now, Le Mans is at the end of June. By the beginning of May in 65, uh, Carcraft has this car ready to be used on a test track. And Ken Miles flies out to Detroit and he drives the 427 GT40, which ultimately became known as a Mark II. He drives it around, he says, dude, we, that's a car I'd like to drive at Le Mans, which is like six weeks away, kind of hard to get it ready. But notwithstanding that, uh, Shelby American and Carcraft working together get two cars ready with a 427 uh, Ford uh, GT40s or Ford GTs. And that's the general subject of the, of the popular movie called uh, Ford versus Ferrari. Anyway, so Ken Miles uh, in May says, we're going to use this big 427 Mark II. That's what I want to use. Well, let's back up a month. Uh, April, uh, 
Pete Brock says, Shelby, what's happening with the super coupe in London from those guys who are supposed to build it? And, and Shelby says, I don't know, let's go over there. So they go over there and they find out the situation is a total, what Pete would call a stroke. The, 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 the story's in my book of that, the super coupe, but the guys were not at, uh, at was called Radfords in England, uh, in London. They were not competent to build the super coupe, weren't competent to build hardly anything. So Pete goes over there, he's rushing to try and finish the car. And then when he realizes uh, he can't finish it in time for Le Mans or any significant race, and he can, could only do one at best during the year, he says, okay, we finished it to the degree of having it be a roller. We can push it around. No engine, no transmission, no wiring, but it does have glass. So well, this is 1965, so Shelby's totally consumed and his operation by building the uh, the 289 GT40s and the uh, Mark II uh, 427 GT40s, and also, guess what, the new uh, sort of a flagship car for Ford, the 1965 uh, Shelby American GT350, which is essentially a Mustang, which is going to give good PR to uh, for Ford. So that's what Ford is wanting. And, and Pete is left here with his his car, which now is is painted in primer, it looks ugly, um, and it's pushed around. And finally, they push it around out there outside at the uh, Los Angeles airport, where they now have their facility. And forget about it. And Al Dowd calls it the super. He called it the Royal Mail Shoot, and other people call it the Super Slug. And so, you know, Pete Brock is is seeing wow. The Cobra isn't really what's happening at Shelby American anymore. It's all these GT40s and these Mustangs. Of course, he's working there. He's uh, he, he wants to be a part of everything, but he's pretty disappointed about the Cobras. The same thing's happening with the 427 Cobra. In 64 and 63, you had groups of three, sometimes even more, team Cobras entered at these major events. But uh, that doesn't happen with the 427 Cobra because the, the push at Shelby American is on developing the GT350 and the GT40s. The 427 Cobra, after Ken Miles develops it, maybe through May and June of 65, that's, that's forgotten. So it's, it's up to the privateers to race the 427 Cobra. And also, by this time, it's also up to the privateers to race the 289. There's support from Shelby American, but there's no more Shelby American teams going out. Uh, uh, in 65, uh, racing anything but the Daytona Coupe, the original of this car, 3002, was raced once by Bondrant, uh, once by Phil Hill, and twice by Ken Miles. So that's the extent of the racing and the development at uh, Shelby American. There are a lot of good racers that, that race the 427. And it took a little more, it was a little more difficult car to, to drive fast because it had that little bit extra weight, uh, but also it was faster down a long straight. So it became sort of the symbol of Shelby American, the, the, uh, the thing that people started identifying Shelby with, the 427. Uh, the 427 streetcar, was probably a little bit better streetcar than the 289 streetcar because the 427 suspension was coil spring and thereby a little bit softer and less jarring than the 289, which was a transfer sleeve uh, uh, suspension, what Dan Gurney called buggy uh, suspension. So they're producing the 427 Cobra through 1966. But if you look at the production records, you'll see that by December 30th, 1966, they had built out all the 427 Cobras and shipped them. So there is really no 1967 Cobra. Uh, there's a lot of 427 Cobras that were titled in 1967, but there's no real 1967 model Cobra. The Cobras stopped by the end of 1966. Of course, when the lawns with Mark IV uh, Ford uh, GT40, not really a GT40, the Mark IV Ford, the 
J car, and Ken Miles dies at the uh, end of 1966 testing that car. Pete Brock leaves at the end of 1965 after people have uh, pushed his car into a corner and uh, named it the super slug and the Royal, Royal Mail Shoot. Now, I'd like to talk a little bit more about the 427 Super Coupe um, because it really illustrates this, the difference between Shelby American as it used to be and what Ford was uh, making happen. Now, bear in mind, we have to be very grateful to Ford for, for bankrolling and financing the whole Shelby American, regardless of what they made, because they made a lot of great stuff. But the story of the 427 Super Coupe really illustrates the difference between a little tiny operation that's got its ear to the ground and is racing every weekend like Shelby American and a gigantic organization like Ford. So Shelby's, if you look at the 427 Super Coupe, it's really Shelby's solution uh, through his little organization, how to uh, economically beat Ferrari, how they could do it. And if you look at the uh, Ford GT40 Mark II with all the money they put into that and all the complexity of that, that's Ford's solution. And the question really uh, comes up uh, in my mind and in Pete Brock's mind, uh, what would have happened if uh, Shelby American had built six uh, 427 Super Coupes like Pete Brock wanted and had them built in Modena by the Italian artisans and and Ford had not built uh, the Mark II Ford, uh, 427 Ford. Uh, I think uh, my opinion is very possible uh, Shelby could have gotten the job done with the 427 Super Coupes certainly at a far less of a cost than with the uh, Ford GT Mark II. There's one thing I like to bring up that's a little sensitive, but I'm going to bring it up anyway. Pete Brock finally told me, that just last year, he said, look, uh, we really, the Super Coupe that was produced, that, that I we built in a hurry there in England, doesn't really fairly represent what the metal uh, beaters there at Grand Sport in Modena would have done. And if you look at the differences between the, the 289 Cobra Daytona Coupe that was built in Los Angeles and the ones that were built in Modena, that there's a very big difference there. And the Italians were artisans, they were artists. So they were gonna make it beautiful. If you look at the, the first couple cars they did, they, they, they just had a great eye for finishing the car, whereas when Pete, uh, when Pete was uh, up there in England, it was him and a helper that finished the 427 Super Coupe that we have today, and Pete had to do it like in six weeks. And Pete was not a sculptor or a, a full-scale metal artisan. So the 427 Super Coupe is one of these uh, might have been stories, uh, but it's an interesting story because uh, for, Ford's solution was to pour money into the uh, Ford GT program and at Shelby American the solution was to get a brilliant guy and let's take the, the, the state of the art, art technology that we know about th that we can readily access and build something and build it economically. So uh, in that respect I think the 427, I, I wish that uh, someone today who's got an extra million dollars would give Pete Brock a call and Pete would take the original drawings and travel over to North Italy and go to Modena and get somebody who's super competent to build a car just like he wanted. It, it, and it would come out beautiful and it would go, as Pete said, it would blow him off down the trap. So I think, I think the 427 Super Coupe was a great car that uh, never really happened the way it should have. So Shelby American, uh, by June of 1967, it's all over. Uh, the guys who are on the team, if you talk to them now, the ones that are still alive, they'll say, we knew that win, lose, or draw by Le Mans 1967 after the race, it was all over because Ford was finished with this publicity marketing exercise. And of course, Shelby was rather tired out and he 
uh, was now missing uh, two of his key employees. Uh, he's missing Pete Brock and he's uh, missing Ken Miles, who was deceased, and, and uh, Phil Remington was would soon leave also. Uh, so Shelby kept on uh, racing the Mustangs for a couple more years. They had one prototype car that was in the hopper as the replacement for the 427 Cobra. It was going to be the 1968 Cobra, or what they called the Mark III Cobra, but that came in, it was only done in uh, June of 1967, and that's when Shelby was shutting down. And that car is the Lone Star, of which I, I is sitting over there, the original that car is sitting behind the, this uh, recreation of the 427 Cobra. Uh, but it was really all over, and so you can see how the 427 Cobra, really, if you know the story of that, it sort of tells the story of Shelby American. An interesting postscript is that uh, the guys who were pushing for the stroked uh, small block, the stroke 289, they were really proven correct, but only years later. Uh, John Wire won Le Mans twice with uh, GT40s that were running uh, stroked uh, small blocks. And today, as a lot of you probably know, you can get a stroke small block that will, will deliver 500 horsepower reliably, which is basically what the 427 motor did. Uh, but the 427 is a great car. I don't mean to denigrate it. It's a neat car. It's got a lot of great advantages, and it is the car that most people think of when they think of Shelby American. It's the iconic car and the one that everybody's copied. I'll talk a little bit about replicas, and there's a lot of names for it, and the names make a difference. Uh, you've got a kit car, you have a replica, you have a recreation car, uh, you have a copy. I guess a copy is a recreation car. This would be probably a recreation car. It certainly was not a kit. They never gave people a bunch of pieces and, and let them, because it's got aluminum body and everything's correct. There's no book out that tells you how many replica Cobras have been made. But, you know, there's got to be way more than 10 times as many original Cobras, maybe 20 times, maybe 30 times, maybe more, a lot. Uh, some of them are, are not very good copies or even good standoffs uh, stand away 20 foot and look at them, they still look wrong, but there's a lot of really great replicas that have been made. Uh, I'll talk about the aluminum ones. This was made by, well the first guy to do the aluminum replicas was uh, Brian Anglis in England, and he bought AC cars, original bucks and tooling that was left, and he started making the cars. Brian did not produce, uh, co his copies were accurate with the body, but he did a lot of changes on, say, upholstery and instruments and all that. But his cars, I was never very excited by his cars, but that's Brian Angus, and, and he was also uh, doing uh, air cars, so he would, somebody would have a, a real 427 that would be destroyed somewhere, or they'd get some pieces from it, and then Brian Angus would take a few pieces and throw them on a brand new car that he made. Uh, the guy who did this car, which was a little after Brian, was Tom D'Antonio in high tech, H-I-T-E-C-H, in uh, Tempe, Arizona. And then uh, Tom D'Antonio, later, he started to run Shelby's operation in Las Vegas, producing a variety of different kinds of 427 Cobra replicas. Well, a guy who was doing this all the time was uh, Mike McCluskey. He's still building cars in uh, Torrance, California, and he is a, an, a, has an excellent shop. And he's, he built pretty much what the customers want, and he also built some Cobra Daytona Coupes. But he did a lot of 427 Cobras and a lot of repair work on the original cars. Kirkham Cars is probably the preeminent one today, and you can look them up on the internet and see what they've got. And I've got a Kirkham car sitting back here, and they're really excellent cars and they improved uh, uh, things a little bit with some of the material they used. And they can produce exact cars, but a lot of the customers who buy Kirkham cars, they want something special, so they get this or that that's uh, machined from a uh, uh, block of aluminum or something. So they, but Kirkham has built a lot of good cars, 
and very good performing cars. Driz Serb uh, has built some of the cars for a Shelby American, they're aluminum uh, roadsters. And Drew Serb operates out of Martinez, California, and he runs the Cobra Experience, which I like to put a plug in for. That's a superb museum, the Cobra Experience. And the last guy I'd like to talk about is a guy who's really done some good stuff, and his name is David Wagner. And David Wagner is up in the Detroit area, and he builds cars rather slowly. He's mostly taken Kirkham cars and then changed all the little tiny details to make them exactly uh, like an original Shelby American production car. And he's done it both with Kirkham uh, 289 transverse leaf spring cars and with uh, the 427 coil spring car. So the, the uh, David Wagner car is not very well known, and he hasn't built that many of them, but they're the best I've seen. Uh, he really does a superb job. And so that's sort of it with the, uh, the story of the 427 Cobra. I would like to say that uh, uh, don't kill yourself in one of these. I first owned the Cobra at the end of 1968, but first drove one in 1969. And traffic and the roads have changed a lot since then, and it's one way to kill yourself to go out and run these things as fast as they'll go on the street. The best way to do it is to get on some sort of closed course where you've got some sort of safety control. Uh, and I will, I would like to also make a comment. I don't know if the, the videographer is going to use this, but you know, today the Cobra has been surpassed as a performance car. Now you can pay, you know, $400,000 to get a Ferrari that'll do it, or heavens, heaven forbid, uh, there is a the new Corvette will do it uh, at a reasonable price. But I still, Cobra's still a great, a great car, and that's what, the car that's close to my heart. And I've had a lot of fun with the Cobra. I'm very grateful to all the people that made it all happen. Thank you very much.